committee will come to order. Today we will hear testimony on the Presidential Records in a New Millennium, updating the Presidential Records Act and other Federal record keeping statutes to improve electronic records preservation. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal workforce. Or, sorry, sorry, to the Federal bureaucracy. You can tell what I had on my mind earlier today. This is the mission of the Government Oversight Committee. Today's hearing concerns the, st the status of executive branch compliance with the letter and spirit of the Presidential's Act, uh, Presidential Records Act. The American people trust in the Presidential Records Act. They trust in this over 30-year-old piece of legislation to preserve for all time the records of each administration. Crafted in the aftermath of Watergate scandal, the Act marked a major step forward in openness and transparency for the White House. By mandating the careful preservation of public uh, accessibility of official records, the American people would have an accurate historical record of decision making. The purpose of this Act is clear, but history moves on, technology moves on, and today we deal, without a doubt, with an administration who has to, by policy, attempt to implement modernization of an Act that never envisioned Facebook and Twitter. This is not a new problem, but it is a growing problem. The Clinton administration first had the digital age, but ultimately saying that email versus uh, paper mail is substantially the same and when printed is identical made it relatively easy to comply with. During the Bush administration, unfortunately, the move from Lotus Notes to Microsoft Exchange made us acutely aware that the quantity of digital information, if not lost, but simply misstored, could end up costing us tens of millions of dollars to recover. In fact, the digital age is more complex and, if not handled correctly, is both more subject to loss of critical records and cost to preserve and recover them. We on the committee have broad oversight, and we try to do each part of government uh, as best we can. But we do have limited special responsibilities. The Presidential Records Act falls to this committee. We take seriously that the decades that have gone by have caused an act fully understood to be very difficult to implement. We look forward to our uh, witnesses helping us as we begin to craft the types of legislative reforms that will codify good policy that has been developed by multiple administrations and go beyond that to make it clear to the American people that all transactions appropriate and equivalent to the original ones captured will be captured in the digital age. I now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, I, before I begin, I would like to commend everyone who worked so hard for so long to bring Osama bin Laden to justice. Uh, I thank our military service members, our intelligence officials, our diplomatic corps, our law enforcement officials, and our Nation's leaders from both political parties. This was a sustained, unrelenting effort over a decade. And it shows that when America confronts its most daunting challenges, we can come together with a striking and inspiring unity of purpose. The Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act are landmark open government laws that are based on a fundamental principle, that Federal agencies must retain records of their official business. These include records that have historical value 
as well as records that are important for administrative, informational, and evidentiary reasons. The electronic age has brought new opportunities for making government work more effectively and efficiently on behalf of American taxpayers. It has also brought new challenges for ensuring that the Federal records are maintained properly. Previously, previous administrations have experienced problems preserving electronic records, particularly emails. During the Clinton administration, the email system experienced technical problems that resulted in lost emails. During the Bush administration, the White House conceded that it lost hundreds of days of official emails, and top officials routinely used their Republican National Committee email accounts for official business. To address these problems, the current system now automatically preserves all emails from White House email accounts. In addition, White House computers block access to private email accounts like Gmail and Hotmail. And finally, if White House employees receive emails relating to official business on their personal accounts, they are directed to preserve those emails either by forwarding them to their official accounts or by printing them. As cutting-edge technologies continue to develop, they will create additional opportunities and challenges. Government officials can now communicate with each other and with the American public in new and creative ways through Facebook, Twitter, and other social media outlets. We want to encourage this kind of innovation. At the same time, we must ensure that records of official communications are preserved. The Obama administration has worked closely with the National Archives to develop new policies relating to social media. To begin with, it has limited uh, access to these platforms to a small fraction of White House employees. It has also worked with the National Archives to develop protocols to save official postings and samples of public comments in a manner that is consistent with its protocols for written correspondence. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I always believe more can be done. So if the question for today's hearing is whether we can improve the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act, the clear answer from this side of the aisle is yes. On March 17, 2011, I introduced H.R. 1144, the Transparency and Openness in Government Act, a package of five bills that overwhelmingly passed the House last Congress with broad bipartisan support, including your own, Mr. Chairman. And every Democratic member of this committee joined me as a an original co-sponsor of this legislation. H.R. 1144 includes the Electronic Message Preservation Act, which modernizes the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act to ensure that White House and agency emails are preserved electronically. Right now, the law requires only that these records be saved. There is no requirement that they be saved electronically. This legislation had such bipartisan support last Congress that it passed the House by voice vote on March 17, 2010. Since I introduced H.R. 1144 in March, a wide spectrum of open government groups has uh, endorsed it. On April 18, 2011, a coalition of 17 organizations wrote to both of us seeking bipartisan support and prompt action in the House. They also said H.R. 1144, the Transparency and Openness in Government Act, will enhance the effectiveness of Federal advisory panels, provide more access to Presidential records, secure electronic messages generated by administration officials, ensure donations to the Presidential libraries are open of the public record, and give the Government Accountability Office more teeth. Mr. Chairman, although you declined to become an original co-sponsor of this legislation uh, back in March, I hope that you and I can work together on this issue in a productive way. And with that, I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member. We now go to our witnesses. Uh, the Honorable David S. Fiaro. I have a terrible time, and I apologize each time, because stereo ferio. The problem is I am not allowed to say stereo before I actually pronounce your name, and I am so sorry. Uh, I am I'm going to keep working on it, because I am going to preserve getting the name right uh, somehow. But I thank you for your testimony today on behalf of the National Archives and Records Administration, and your work there is critical to our understanding of where reform is necessary. 
Mr. Gary Stern, the general counsel to uh, uh, the NARAS, the National uh, Records Act, Office of Archivist, and Mr. Brooks Colangelo, better than, better than I'm doing with Ferio, uh, is the chief information officer of the executive office of the President. And I appreciate uh, your being here today. As you know, we also wanted the policy team, but uh, I know that you come with probably the most critical information for today, so I'm pleased to have you here. Pursuant to the rules of the committee, could you all rise to take the oath? And raise your right arms. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Ferriero, as you know, you have been here before. The, uh, uh, we do the green, the yellow, the red. The important thing is that all of your statements are in the record, and although you may go off on script, uh, to the extent that you can add to what is already going to be the record, not simply repeat it, we would appreciate it. And with that, you are recognized for five minutes. And thank you. Thank you. And good morning, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Cummings. Thank you for calling the hearing and for your continued attention to the management and preservation of government records. As you mentioned, General Counsel Gary Stearns accompanies me this morning and will be available to answer questions from the committee. I am pleased to appear before you today to discuss the work that NARA does to implement the government recordkeeping laws, the Presidential Records Act, PRA, and the Federal Records Act, FRA. The Archives has been responsible for setting government-wide policy on how all Federal agencies manage their records since the enactment of the FRA in 1950. The FRA, however, does not apply to the President, the Vice President, and those members of their staffs that advise and assist them, nor does it govern recordkeeping by Congress and the Supreme Court. The Presidential Records Act of 1978 established public ownership of all Presidential and Vice Presidential records, but it vested all records management and authority entirely and exclusively with the incumbent President and Vice President. The legislative history of the PRA states that the President is encouraged to implement sound records management practices. Because the PRA presumes that all Presidential records must be permanently preserved and transferred to the National Archives at the end of the President's administration, the Act allows for comparatively straightforward records management policy. That is, the White House saves all Presidential records, with the exception of some publicly received bulk mail correspondence where a sampling is saved and all Presidential records are transferred to NARA when the President leaves office. In 1994, the Clinton administration established the policy of preserving all White House email records with an electronic recordkeeping system. The George W. Bush administration continued this policy. While both administrations experienced some problems, as you mentioned, preserving their emails, which required restoration projects, the overall concept of capturing and preserving electronic presidential records in their entirety became the accepted practice. NARA staff has successfully transferred the electronic presidential records of these two administrations, along with all other records, into the National Archives. Throughout the course of an administration, both I and my staff provide guidance and advice on matters affecting White House records management when invited to do so. In this administration, NARA staff meet regularly with staff in the White House Office of Administration and other Executive Office of the President components on electronic records issues and provide guidance as requested. For example, we have provided advice on the preservation of Presidential record material generated by the White House and posted on social media websites, and we have provided sampling methodology for archiving those types of records. NARA has testified several times before this committee on the continuing challenges that Federal agencies across the government have in managing and preserving electronic records under FRA. The FRA requires each agency to follow NARA's guidance and implement a records management program. We have developed an extensive set of regulations and guidance on how agencies need to manage their records. At the beginning of his administration, President Obama issued a Presidential Memorandum on Transparency and Open Government. NARA has subsequently emphasized that the backbone of a transparent and open government is good records management. To put it simply, the government cannot be open or accountable if it does not preserve and cannot find its records. In February 2011, we issued our second annual records management self-assessment report with respect to how agencies manage electronic records. 
The report noted that records management programs in many agencies are at risk. In September 2010, NARA also produced a report on Federal Web 2.0 use and record value that noted the web landscape is evolving so rapidly that if we neglect to address these issues, we risk losing the truly valuable materials created by the Federal Government. In that report, we made several recommendations which are included in my written testimony. One of the fundamental challenges that agencies have in managing electronic records under the FRA and what distinguishes them from records governed by the PRA is the need to separate permanent records from temporary records. Electronic records management systems generally require significant user input to file individual records, resulting in few agencies managing and preserving their email records electronically. Rather, most agencies simply rely on print-to-paper as their official records management policy for email and many other electronically created records. While the FRA still provides a viable statutory framework for managing Federal records, we believe that there could be ways to modernize the FRA to improve the management of electronic records. Before closing, I do want to raise one critical but often overlooked point. Ultimately, responsibility for records management will always rest to some degree with individual Federal employees, no matter what systems are in place. That was true in an era, era of exclusively paper records, and it remains true in an increasingly digital age. As the archivist of the United States, I have made the management, preservation, and future access to electronic records my highest priorities. Indeed, as part of the transformation process that I have initiated within NARA, we have set up our own records management laboratory to develop and test best practices. I am committed to working with Congress, the White House, and Federal agencies to do all that we can to improve electronic records management and preservation. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. Thank you for the, your attention, and I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Ferriero. Mr. Stearns, I understand you don't have an opening statement, but do you have any comments at this time? No, I will just defer to questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coangelo, thank you. Uh, you may proceed. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of this committee. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing on potential changes to the Presidential Records Act and other records laws. I am pleased to appear before you to discuss information technology systems in place for the Executive Office of the President and their impact on electronic records management. I have served as the Chief Information Officer of the Office of Administration since January of 2009. OA provides common administrative and support services to the components of the Executive Office of the President, including the White House Office, the National Security Staff, Office of and Office of Management and Budget. As CIO, I oversee all unclassified enterprise technology systems and services. For the, from the first days of the administration, it was clear that the EOP IT systems were struggling to maintain stable and secure operations due to an aging IT infrastructure. Over 82 percent of our assets were end of life and no longer supported by their manufacturer. Enterprise software was severely out of date and had not been upgraded in years. The EOP had a single data center and no viable plan for a secondary disaster recovery. These flaws led to multiple email and network outages in the first 40 days of the administration. We have devoted significant time and resources to modernizing the EOP IT systems in order to enhance stability, ensure security, and provide robust electronic records management. Among, the, among other initiatives, we have replaced network switches, overhauled our Internet connection, patched network gear, migrated to Exchange 2007, moved to BlackBerry Enterprise Server 5.0 increased and upgraded our storage area network, expanded our cybersecurity tools, and began to stand up a disaster recovery data center. Amid these efforts, we have, proactively, we have worked proactively to improve electronic records management while adapting to emerging technologies. Although past White Houses have, faced, have struggled with email preservation, starting from the first day of this administration, email has been preserved through an automated archiving system that was procured by the Bush White House. We are now taking steps to upgrade or replace this system before it becomes outdated. We have also, we've also upgraded our email and BlackBerry servers to improve the reliability, and we are the first administration to begin archiving SMS text and pin-to-pin -pin messages on EOP BlackBerry devices. Although we have explored an enterprise solution for archiving records created on social networks, due to a lack of a suitable enterprise solution, EOP components currently use a combination of automated and manual methods to archive these records. 
Finally, we have installed a new content management system on the White House website that archives every change to the site. These initiatives have improved electronic records management on the EOP IT systems. Additionally, we have made it easier for staff to work on those systems. We have deployed secure mobile workstations, ena enabling staff to work on EOP systems while traveling or at home. Staff also have secure web-based access to EOP desktop and applications, enabling them to work in a records-managed environment from any computer. We also restrict EOP network access to, to websites that could pose risk to records management or security. This, this includes sites like Gmail, Yahoo Mail, Facebook, Twitter, along with instant messaging sites like AOL Instant Messenger from the EOP network. A limited number of staff have access to approved social networking sites for official business, but cannot access web mail sites like Gmail or instant messaging. Staff who receive access and are subject to the Presidential Record Act receive supplemental briefing from their records management, on their records management obligations. We also restrict the ability of EOP personnel to connect personal devices to the EOP network. These proactive IT measures are reinforced by EOP policies. Employees are instructed to conduct all work on EOP systems, including electronic communications, except in emergency circumstances when they cannot access the EOP systems and must accomplish time-sensitive work. Staff receive guidance that the PRA applies to work-related electronic communications on personal accounts and are instructed to take appropriate steps to preserve any records on their personal accounts, such as forwarding those communications to their EOP account or copying their EOP account on outgoing emails. Through these proactive measures, we hope to improve the EOP electronic records management and address the challenges presented by emerging technologies. I hope this background information and that in my written testimony aids the committee consideration of potential changes to the Presidential Records Act and other Federal record-keeping law. Mr. Chairman, I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. I would recognize myself for five minutes at this time. Mr. Colangelo, are any of these carried into the White House? iPads, sir? Yes. We have not deployed iPads for enterprise use. Are any of these carried into the White House? Have you ever seen one of these in the White House? Yes. So people carry a product which circumvents your entire system by going to the AT&T network on a daily basis in the White House. Isn't that true? Nothing stops someone from using this or other Wi-Fi connected, not to your, any Wi-Fi in the White House, but to AT&T, Verizon, Sprint systems, and they communicate freely from the White House to Gmail or any other account. Isn't that true? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have strong policy along with enterprise technology that, that that captures our records on the EOP network. I heard you. Answer my question, please. If I take an, an app, a product, into the White House, as I did last night for dinner, sure. I have full communication capability. You don't block any Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, or T-Mobile. The fact is that people every day bring their private property into the White House and can Gmail, Hotmail, and the like from within the White House, correct? Individuals are not restricted to restricted on what they bring into the White House on personal devices on the person. So someone, if they chose to, could be, you know, emailing back and forth to the DNC from the White House, and you would not have the ability to capture that. Is that correct? We have uh, we provide training and policy to staff I, on. It's, please, you know. I am asking you only the technical questions because you don't make policy. Correct. I asked for the policy person. I was denied that person. So let's stick to straightforward. I am not after the President. I am not after the administration. I am after the changes in technology and whether or not we are equipped to deal with them. Today, there are hundreds of products in the old Executive Office, in the Treasury Building, and in the White House proper you, being used to communicate, whether you like it or not, to private emails. They are simply connected. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. We are not making an issue out of it. That is the reality of the last decade of changes. And, and, I, and I hopefully our work here is not about the current occupant of the White House, but about an act that has survived multiple presidents with ever-changing challenges. Mr. Fierro, if someone were to produce a book five years from now, and they had their Gmail records, their uh, Microsoft Word documents, all of which were produced on private computers using the cloud, 
while they were sitting inside the White House or working as covered persons for the Office of the President, would you believe you are entitled to that source material under the Presidential Records Act? If, if that um, content was work for that administration, again, yes, that is a presidential record. And don't most uh, kiss and tell books that come out after a president is gone, usually, but not always after, don't they basically talk about meetings, experiences, and so on? And ultimately, aren't they most often from information that is either written, typed, or, or in some other way captured uh, during the time they are either employees of the White House or physically in the White House? That is just the reality of, of what we see post-president. Exactly. And in, and in fact, um, some of the heaviest users of our Presidential Library's collections are former members of the administration. They have got to supplement what they took with them. How do you propose in a digital age that we deal with those correspondence uh, that occur? You know, ultimately, the President is both the head of the armed forces, the head of the administration, and the head of his party. How do we appropriately capture that which we should capture, not capture that which we shouldn't, by statute rather than policy? Well, as I said, the way the law is written, the control, unlike the Federal Records Act, the control of that content rests with the President and the Vice President. So what we are, uh, the position that we have is guidance, is to provide guidance. And um, Mr. Stern meets with his um, colleagues from the White House on a regular basis to provide that kind of guidance and to understand how technology is being used in the White House. Are all of you comfortable that a, I'll decide which one of my Gmails fits that based on my training, is sufficient? Well, it's our view that the, the statute, both statutes, even though they're old and were written in a time of principally paper records, are all encompassing. They include language about included but not limited to, all formats and all. So any official uh, communications involving their work are presumptively presidential record regardless of what system they are used on. We are also, it is also our clear understanding from this administration and prior administrations that the policy is you must use the government systems. So policy, but not the statute, and as we already heard, they do use non-government systems. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a policy that when you send and receive on your Gmail, you forward it into the official system. By definition, you can't have it both ways. You can't say the policy is that you only use official, and then the policy is on those many, 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 many occasions in which you don't use the official, please forward for the record. Right. Clear, clearly, clearly, the policy is not getting the job done completely. Well, and I guess the question is, does that occur often, or our understanding is it can occur in emergency situations? and the like, and whether it occurs on a regular basis, we are not aware of that. It's but but let me answer your question. Your Please. question was, are you comfortable? No, I am not. Anytime there is human intervention, then I am not comfortable. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, we can agree that Federal employees should not use uh, personal email to conduct official business, I think. Is that right, gentlemen? You, Mr. Ferrario? And however, there are many can, times when they can if they forward that communication to their official email. Okay. However, there are many times when using personal email might be necessary. Uh, for example, in the event of a natural disaster or a terrorist attack, communicating on official email may be impossible. Would you agree? Agree. Mr. Agree. And Mr. Colangelo. Uh, in your testimony, you described several instances where the White House system experienced email outages. Is that correct? That is correct. Certainly, it should be made clear to employees that it is their responsibility to forward any records created on their personal email to their official email. Now, Mr. Colangelo and Mr. Ferrario, we don't want employees to just stop performing their duties in the White House. Uh, or agency email system, if a, it goes down, do we? Do, would we? We don't want that to happen if the agency system goes down. We In other words, for them to stop doing business. Exactly. So under that same circumstance, you want to make sure that they preserve whatever Good. records they, they uh, right. had. Currently, the White House blocks access to personal email on White 
house computers. Employees are prohibited from even connecting personal electronic devices to the uh, EOP network. Is that correct, gentlemen? That is correct. Uh, yet some still promote the false notion that White House employees are sitting around all day on their personal iPhones accessing these personal email accounts to evade the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act. Mr. Colangelo, what more could be done? I suppose Federal agencies could ban employees from carrying personal cell phones and work. Uh, they could do that, couldn't they? Uh, that is more of a policy question, Congressman. I am a technologist. And do we really want to create such an extreme big brother mentality like this? Mr. Fierio, what else could we do? Uh, the, the evolving guidance that we are working on in, in this particular administration is a good indication of how the system should work in a healthy environment. Um, it's, as I said, the control is with the White House, and it's, um, the, the quality of the product depends on, upon the relationship with the administration. And so, but you, but so are you, you are not for stopping the use of personal email? In other words, will we, do you think it is a good idea to require all Federal employees to stop using any personal email as a condition of Federal employment? There are instances, as you described, when that is the only solution. And as far as I am concerned, that should be the guidance. You use your personal connections when you don't have access otherwise. Okay. Now, and, you I, ensure that that, and you ensure that that record then gets transferred to your official email. And so obviously there are extreme and ridiculous proposals designed to make a point. At its most basic level, compliance with recordkeeping laws comes down to employees making decisions. Is that right? That is the human element I was talking about. Yeah. And, Mr. Fierro, isn't there inherently some level of discretion that must be allowed to ensure that employees can comply with the law while also doing their jobs? Is that right? That is right. Now, last year you uh, applauded the, our legislation, the legislation that I um, spoke of about in my opening statement, did you not? I did. And you, you su supported it with great enthusiasm, did you not? I did. And why is that? Because it points us in the right direction in terms of how we deal with our electronic records, and it also raises the consciousness of Congress about the importance of records, which is a, pr a real problem that I have inherited as the archivist of the United States. So, you are, so you, would, you, you, would you agree with me that that would be a giant step in the right direction? It would, it, points us in the right direction. I agree. And is there anything that you would like to see added to that legislation? One of the things that worries me most is the retention issue. Um, the way the, the, um, the Federal Records Act is currently written, the, um, we are in a, still in a 1950s paper mode where agencies, many agencies, have a 30-year retention policy for their records. 30 years in an electronic environment is incredibly dangerous. Now, Mr. Chairman, I uh, failed in my opening statement to uh, ask that the letter, uh, letters that I mentioned uh, with regard to the letter I sent to you back uh, a while back on, in March with regard to our legislation and, and the, the Transparency Act, and then the letter I sent to you yesterday just to be a part of the record, uh, as you then was concerned. Uh, I'm familiar. The first one is without objection, so ordered. The one yesterday was on, on this subject. Yes, yes. Uh, Just asking for a markup. That's all. Oh, of course. Uh, then, without, without objection, so ordered. Mr. Stereo, would you, or Ferio, I'm sorry, would you please, uh, I'll get it eventually. I am so sorry. You, you said things are so dangerous, and I don't think the ranking member got to hear what was so dangerous about 30 years in an electronic age. Because of, um, as you know, uh, because of changes in technology, 30 years um, to be retained in an agency is a very long time different, uh, migra different uh, uh, information technology systems being used, uh, different records management systems being used, great risk of loss of records in 30 years. In other words, we can't read DOS 3.3 so well today. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Uh, Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
would you pronounce your name? Because Desjardins gets butchered all the time, and I don't want to start off saying yours wrong. Rhymes with stereo. Ferio. Ferio. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we started in on this discussion just now on, on the 30-year uh, problem in document preservation. I think maybe we should explore that further. And Mr. Stern, uh, certainly feel free to jump in. Uh, does the NARA favor elimination of the current 30-year presumption? Yes. And, and I just add, the 30-year issue is about uh, when they transfer permanent records into the National Archives. For agencies, only a tiny fraction of the, all the records they create are permanent for transfer into the archives. And our concern is on permanent records, we want to ensure we get them as early as possible so that we don't have a, a, a problem of, of format obsolescence. Often on presidential record keeping, is it common that uh, on the second term they are more aggressive at getting these archived? Is it something, your presumption, that we should start earlier in uh, a president's term? Well, I mean, the advantage of in any presidential term, even two terms, that is only eight years at the longest. So that is relatively recent enough that that we are able to get, the, uh, get all the records in, uh, in a reasonable good format. But we are, uh, we work with the uh, new administration on day one, and from our perspective, we are planning a transition the first day the President is in office in terms of working and coordinating to ensure that all records, and particularly electronic records, will be in the right shape and format so they can be transferred to us when the President uh, leaves office. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ferrario, which and how many Federal agencies currently take advantage of pre-accessioning and turn over their documents before they are required to do so? Pre-accessioning? The uh, early turnover of documents. Only about half a dozen. Half a dozen? Right. And you would like to see that? In I would be, um, actually, as the archivist, I would be um, really interested in getting in at the creation um, and not, and so that we have uh, better control. What part of the Federal Records Act would have to be updated to eliminate the current 30-year presumption? I believe it is Section 2107, 2108 uh, have, have language uh, with respect to the agency retention up to 30 years. Okay. Would the NARA prefer a default preservation rule that requires periodic turnover, quarterly, semiannually, annually, of uh, agency electronic documents? We are um, exploring various models. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stern, would the NARA be able to handle a shift to periodic submission of agency electronic documents at current funding and, and person, personnel levels? Yeah, we, we think we will. I mean, in, in terms of pre -ex the issues of pre-accessioning, we would just get copies for storage in its original format. The agencies would still have legal custody and be responsible for access, use, all of those issues until there is the formal legal transfer, which still could take place many years down the line. We just want to ensure we get a copy set uh, that we can preserve in, in that um, original format. Okay, Mr. Ferriero, uh, shifting gears a little bit. The Federal Records Act appears to split the responsibility for managing Federal records between the NARA and GSA. Is this by design or a remnant of the old GSA authorizing statute? This is a remnant. Okay. Uh, 1985, the, the agency separated from GSA, and that um, still is in the law. Are there any practical functional problems as a result of the fact that the Federal Records Act talks of GSA as having a role in the Federal Record Management? Not really. Okay. And they have never exercised any, um, at, at least in my experience, they have never exercised any authority over records. And do you have any um, idea what GSA's perspective is regarding possible clarification of duties? I'm sure they would be amenable. They, they'd favor it. I, I would. Okay. I would guess. All right. Um, Mr. Stern, what parts of the Federal Records Act would have to be updated to clarify NARA's exclusive custodial role? Uh, I believe that's in uh, um, Chapter 29. Is, is where to talk about the responsibilities of the archivist and the administrator of GSA. So that would be a place to look to to, to clarify that issue. Okay. And Mr. Colangio, I wasn't meaning to ignore you. I was afraid I might mispronounce your, tame, your name as well, but I'm out of time and I'll yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. You gave me back 12 seconds. Well, I hate to do that. That's all right. We'll let it happen this one time. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. 
I'm, I'm sorry. We, I got my paper just as I announced the wrong order. So now I have the right order, starting with yourself. The uh, chairman for calling this uh, meeting on this important uh, topic. Um, a lot of what we are talking about today involves the preserving of uh, Federal records. And, but preserving Federal records is really, in my opinion, not, a, not enough. I would say that it is equally as important to make these records available to the press and, uh, and available to the general public. Now, the American people have a right to know uh, what their government is doing. Uh, what meetings are taking place, what they are working on. And one of the ways that they are able to figure this out is by having uh, the press really report on, on the records, on what the government is doing. I, I would like to point out that the Obama administration has taken uh, many very important uh, uh, steps to open up government and to allow the public to see what is taking place it is probably the most transparent uh, government in the history of our country. And I would like to give one specific uh, example and ask for your um, comment on this. In December of 2009, the White House began making all visitor access logs available on the White House website so the public knows who is wooing whom, who is going to the meetings, what are they working on? Who has access? So I'd like to ask Mr. Ferrero or Mr. Stern uh, to comment on how important a step was this for the White House to make the visitor logs available to the general public, to the press to write about it. This is the first time in history this has been opened up to the American people. How important a step is this? I will start. I, I think it is incredibly important, um, but it, it also needs to be coupled with other heads of agencies releasing their calendars and their schedules also. And we haven't made as much progress there. Mr. Stern, do you have a comment? Well, um, with respect to those records, uh, we add that we, of course, those records are preserved as presidential records, and they are all transferred to the National Archives when the President leaves office. So we have White House entry records going all the way back, even before there was an electronic system, all the way back to uh, entry records in the, in the Roosevelt White House. And, and so it is certainly our mission as the National Archives to open records as quickly as we can when they come to us, and we always encourage uh, the rest of the government to be as open as they can, too. But this is the first time it has been open to the general public before it went to archives. I believe on a website. On a systematic basis, that is my understanding, yes. Uh, I, I would also like to point out that this administration has probably been more effective uh, than any other in the history of our country and has made use of the social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, blogging. And uh, these applications uh, bring uh, great innovation and allow people to have access to what our government is doing and what the activities are. But they also bring very special challenges uh, for the archiving of this information because of the, the tremendous volume uh, that is uh, generated every single day. So I would like to ask you, Mr. Ferriero, the National Archives has a blog, Facebook page, and Twitter, and a YouTube accounts, and, and how, how do you preserve the records generated on this uh, social media? How do, you, how do you preserve it now? It is an exciting time to be the archivist because of the rapid changes in technology um, and also because of, as you mentioned, the volume of content that is now being genera generated. We have um, developed guidelines for um, the, the agencies to consider their use of social media. It is on our website, and we uh, have raised a, a series of questions with them um, to analyze the content of their postings on social media to make decisions about whether they are records or not. If they are records, then they need to be captured, just as um, under the guidance of the Federal Records Act. And we have provided guidance on the, the capture of, of that content also. Would you say the benefits of using social media and these various tools to communicate with the general public uh, outweigh the challenges posed to archiving it? 
Yes, definitely. This administration is committed to involving the American public in the workings of government in a way that it has never been involved before, and this is the way it is happening. I would like to close, since both of you have mentioned the importance of having the agencies involved and that the performance of the agencies in managing electronic records are equally as important. And I would just like to point out that we have a bill before Congress, the Message Preservation Act, that calls upon the agencies to electronically save this information and to save their emails electronically. And I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me and many others in, in pushing for the passage of this bill. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Uh, the, the gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Ferrier, thank you for being here. certainly appreciate your leadership and, and your time, and uh, certainly appreciate it with uh, uh, Chairman Clay, last Congress, uh, having oversight in our subcommittee of NARA, and appreciate the hard work that you do. also appreciate the fact that you have a North Carolina connection. So, uh, I wanted to ask you about the print-to-paper policy. Um, could you discuss the drawbacks to, to this, this idea that, uh, rather than keeping a digital record, which seems uh, more efficient, uh, easier to search, uh, easier to maintain, I would, I, would, I would guess it would be easier to maintain, um, compared to this idea that you uh, simply print something off and put in a file? I already have 10 billion pieces of paper. <laughs> I don't need any more paper. It is embarrassing that in the year 2011 our guidance is print and save. We should be capturing this electronically. The storage costs, I have 44 facilities around the country, the storage costs for paper are enormous. Uh, what ways can we improve this? The, um, the guidance in, the, uh, in EMPA um, is to uh, acknowledge, as we have in the Presidential Records Act, acknowledge electronic communication as record. That will help. Um, what part of the Federal Records Act would have to be updated in order to in insist that we have electronic records? Um, you know, we'd have to look at the specific provisions, but uh, I mean, we are familiar with the legislation, the EMPA, and, and that that would um, uh, amend, uh, I believe it's um, through Chapter 29, but um, and there may be other provisions that warrant. Um, uh, looking at in terms of mandating electronic preservation of at least electronic messages, as that statute does, and that's that's you know our view is that's uh, we support the goals uh, of that effort. Okay. Um, now, uh, Dr. Ferrio, we've discussed this before, and in, in a larger, broader context, um, you inherited uh, a lot of difficulties uh, coming in as archivists. And I've asked you this at every hearing that you've been before the committee, so you, you probably know where I'm going with this. But in terms of, of uh, how employees rank their happiness with their job and fulfillment with their job, NARA has had some challenges. And I mean, you discussed 44 facilities. It's a pretty large institution you're running. Um, but in comparison to other Federal employees, uh, work satisfaction hasn't been the highest at NARA. Um, and that has led, in, in my opinion, to some, some data losses that, 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 based off of people not getting full fulfillment out of their job, uh, haven't taken the pride in preserving some of these documents. Now, I, I, I know you've got a very credible staff. You've got great folks that work at NARA. But what have you done to improve this in, in the year and, the, year and a half? Uh, yeah, actually, a year and a half now. Uh, 18 months you have you've been on the job. You are right. We are tied for last place uh, in the Employee Viewpoint Survey, tied with HUD, um, and it is not um, where I want us to be. We have in the past um, eight months gone through a major reorganization, transformation of the agency, and created um, basically a new organization, driving out um, repetitive um, kinds of operations and streamlining and making it more efficient, but most importantly, putting 
our user community in the center of what we are doing, and engaging the staff in this process. And the engagement of the staff through social media um, internally has uh, really had an impact on how people feel about being part of one large agency. Um, I have visited now 32 of our 44 facilities, so I have had an opportunity to meet firsthand with the staff to talk to them. First question, what is it like to work here? Um, tell, me, tell me the stories, um, with and without supervisors. So I have gotten a, big, a, a, a really good picture of what works and what doesn't work, and we are serious about turning um, that around to make it the best agency in the government. Very good. Very good. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for your testimony today, and thank you all for uh, your service to our government. The Chair uh, now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, for, uh, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for not stumbling over my name. It is very simple. Um, Mr. Uh, Archivist Ferio, it is very good to see you again. I would like to take a a moment to say uh, that you are doing an outstanding job uh, leading the National Archives. Your reorganization, your transformation of the agency uh, will, I, I believe, result in uh, vastly improved services uh, to all of the stakeholder, uh, stakeholders and customers that you serve. Uh, this is especially true regarding open government and electronic records management. I would like to ask you about regulations. As you know, uh, the House last year passed the Electronic Message Preservation Act, or EMPA. Uh, under this legislation, you would be required to issue regulations to agencies and the White House on the preservation of electronic messages. Uh, this Congress uh, Ranking Member Cummings has introduced H.R. 1144, uh, the Transparency and Openness in Government Act, which includes the language of EMPA. H.R. 1144 also includes the Presidential Records Act amendments, which overwhelmingly passed the House the last Congress. Uh, Archivist Ferriero, with these improvements, along with the existing statute, provide you with the tools that you need in order to help agencies comply with Federal recordkeeping statutes? And can you elaborate on how exactly these improvements would be helpful? We are, we are very supportive of the direction of H.R. 1144. Um, as I said, and I don't want to um, keep repeating myself, the, my biggest concern um, is about retention, how long electronic records are retained in the agencies. And if we can deal with that, um, I will be um, happy. Well, thank you. And, uh, and, and, and so you agree that, that we need to update, we need to get rid of the paper. I agree. And <laughs> I love and, paper. But, and you've um, driven that point home <laughs> this morning about paper, and, and it does become cumbersome. Uh, and there are ways to transfer that data over to electronic means in this day and age. Uh, let me ask Mr. Colangelo, what is the current state of the White House email archiving system? Is it up to task? Uh, Congressman, yes. The email archiving is uh, fully operational and is ingesting all, all email, to the best of my knowledge. And then, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, this is more of a comment uh, than a question, but during the previous administration, uh, this committee discovered something very disturbing. This was after we learned that the previous White House was unable to properly manage the emails in their system, and many were lost. Uh, on top of that, dozens of senior White House officials conducted official business uh, using their Republican National Committee email accounts instead of their official government accounts. Uh, countless records, perhaps millions, that should have been preserved under Federal statutes were lost. Uh, Mr. Colangelo, do we have to worry about those same problems in this White House? So, 
Uh, Congressman, what we have done um, since 2009 is worked um, with the technology that the Bush administration uh, procured, which is a commercial off-the-shelf product, a proven technology to archive records. Um, so our, the EOP email systems are being uh, archived. Additionally to that, we have also stabilized our systems and enhanced mobility so that we offer users uh, you know, uh, many choices to access the EOP system when they need to do their EOP work, either from a laptop or a secure web-based system, so that they have the opportunity to do EOP work um, anytime. Thank you for your response and all, and all of the witnesses' response. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Uh, the Chair will now recognize uh, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists for being here this morning. Um, my question has to do with the split between um, the responsibility for managing Federal records with regards to NARA and uh, GSA. If you could, um, what we are looking at right now appears to split the responsibility. Is that by design, or is that something that was just so happened that way? Yeah, um, the National Archives used to be part of GSA, and uh, we um, um, in 1985 we were split and became an independent agency from GSA. But uh, when they revised the statute at that time, they left some responsibilities. Um, for economy and efficiency and such with GSA in coordination with the Archives of the United States. Our experience in the last 25 plus years is that GSA has really lost interest and hasn't played any uh, functional role in dealing with management and preservation of records. So, um, you know, I think it's not unreasonable to consider whether they need to be, have a role in the statute. And as uh, the archivist testified earlier this morning, uh, we don't think GSA will likely have any resistance either. I apologize. I have been advised that this has already been covered before I got here, so I apologize for that. Um, Let us go to the whole email question and, and the preservation of those. Um, do you have, uh, Mr. Fierio, any uh, recommendations regarding potential additional rules for, for ensuring that the transfer of the Presidential Administration Electronic document, documents will be finished within a 60-day time frame. Is there, how can we make sure that happens? I'm not sure the 60 days where that comes from. I believe that that's um, the, the transfer actually happens at the end of the administration. So every, everything is retained in the White House um, until the administration changes. And in fact, during the inauguration ceremony. Archive staff is in the White House. Um, Would the gentlelady yield for? Sure. To the gentlelady's question, would you prefer that there be transfers during the administration so that, in fact, if there are any questions, you find out about them whether well, they are still using the same software and the same personnel are still there? That is a good question. We. Um, We have, as I said, we have these regular meetings with um, with our co colleagues in the White House about their you know, how they're managing their records. Um, I hadn't really thought about capturing them sooner. It's certainly an attitude I have about the um, on the other side on the federal records um, scenario. I believe that this issue was raised because. Um in the instance where, with, obviously with President Clinton and President Bush, mm -hmm. those were two terms. But in the event that there was a single-term president, right. uh, the turnaround within the 60 days, I think that is where I that see. question came from. Thank you. I yield back. Oh, would the gentlelady yield, further yield? Sure. Uh, yes. Mr. Ferriero, you earlier uh, talked in terms of what could be captured, what couldn't be captured. Obviously, the, uh, the ranking member and I have uh, an agreement that in times of an emergency in which the system is down, you come as you are, bring what you have, and do what you must. But assuming that there are covered persons, and we would have to define covered person, persons not to be just anybody, but covered persons that have personal emails and personal Facebooks, 
do you believe the statute should give a absolute right for those covered persons documents if you will to be reviewed by a third party to ensure that there is compliance with the law i'm not talking about you know if you will preempting people's personal rights but if you're a covered person and you have access and you may or may not have used it is that discretion something you'd like to see reviewable at least by the office of the presidency itself certainly by the office of the presidency yes um and I could, you know, in, after more thought, um, you know, ex, ex, extend that. My, my concern, as I have said, has to do with any time there is the human element involved when someone has to make a decision uh, and remember to transfer those to their official, their, their official um, email system. The beauty of the White House email system now is it automatically captures it. It is 100 percent, even if it is just you emailing your wife to say you will be late, like so many people do at the White House every day. That is right, isn't it? Perfect. Correct. It, it emails all in and outbound communication, Copy, uh, preserves all in and outbound communications. So I guess my, my, my follow-up, uh, Mr. Colangelo, is since you capture 100 percent of all communication on the exchange system at the White House, and since that includes private conversations that do occur, I mean, people do email home you know, E.T., I'm phoning home, I won't be home at any reasonable time tonight, they just killed bin Laden. If that happens, you capture it, it's there. Thirty years from now, people will be able to see what somebody said that evening to their family on why they weren't going to be home till after midnight. Shouldn't we, in reverse, also have that ability to collect data from covered persons the other direction in some organized way, in your opinion? From, from a technology standpoint, Mr. Chairman, I am not necessarily sure how we would collect data from personal accounts. Uh, but, um, you know what? The time has expired. I, I yield back. Chairman, I yield uh, back. I would, thank you. At this time, we recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and, Mr. Chairman, I would ask without objection my opening statement be entered into the records. Without objection, so ordered. I thank the Chair. Uh, Mr. Ferriero, uh, NARA's 2010 Records Management Self Assessment Report identifies uh, several difficulties in managing electronic records technological complications in preservation, proper disposition, the volume, propriety and cutting edge technology used to create records, and decentralized environment in which they reside. Uh, what mechanisms are currently in place to encourage collaboration between records management and IT professionals as needed? That is a terrific question. Um, I have been the archivist for 18 months. and Did you hear that, Mr. Chairman? It was a terrific question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the first um, partnerships I created was with the, the CIO. The CIO, um, you know, sits at the head of the CIO Council. We have a Records Management Council also. And I discovered that the records managers and the um, information officers have never worked together, talked, you know, met together. And the, so the situation is we have got the IT folks off developing systems, all of which have records implications, not talking to their records managers. So we convened the first ever joint meeting of the two to start this relationship of records managers being at the table with their um, CIOs uh, as new systems were being developed. The, the situation is um, even more complicated for me because in the wonderful world of federal job, the job family, there is no such thing as a records manager. So we are working now with OPM to create um, a, a family of jobs around information management that will address the problem. So the result is, in many agencies and sub-agencies, the assignment for records management falls to the most junior person in the agency, not a full-time job, high turnover, not very well trained, um, and we get what we get um, from that situation. Um, a recent report by the American Council for Technology Industry uh, on government best practices for social media record keeping identified the need to develop communications between social media team and records management as best practice number one. The report also said, until best practices and tools emerge to assist in the records management of social media records, 
agencies are tending toward retaining all social media content so that those portions that are records are protected. Given the overwhelming volume of data this could encompass, um, I would be interested in your thoughts about what is the best practice going forward, how do we, uh, what are the challenges of the save everything approach uh, uh, to, to management? The, the issue that I described about CIOs and records managers um, is similar to uh, records managers and web managers. So we have recently brought together the federal web managers and the uh, records managers to talk about this very issue of uh, what needs to be captured and how it needs to be captured. Uh, I referred earlier to us um, uh, some guidance that NARA has provided for helping those folks responsible for social media to ask a series of questions about the content to determine whether it is record or not record. You, you make reference to NARA, and, um, and uh, I think there was some indication that these best practices would be put on the website. Any idea of timeline for that? Um, The, um, the guidance is up, the report is up. In terms of best practices, that is coming. When? So, <laughs> what is that? When? This, right. Within a year. Within a year. That's hmm. uh, hopefully sooner. Yes, um, I agree. My time is almost running out, but Mr. Colangelo, um, is it really reasonable to expect uh, employees in the White House not to, from time to time, have to make, uh, to use Gmail or to use their iPads to communicate with spouses, friends, family, whatever. I mean, that that's not something that's normally enforced in the normal workplace. Uh, uh, that's correct. Um, that communication also um, takes the stress off of our system, so it reduces the work system is only for work systems, and it keeps the the clear separation between personal and government issue equipment. But so people are allowed to use their work computers for Gmail? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, on their government equipment, they are not allowed to access social media or web-based email sites. It is blocked from a technical standpoint on our network. So it's a much stricter standard than exists in most workplaces. That's correct. I thank you. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Oklahoma. Is recognized, Mr. Langford. I would like to yield back my time to the chairman at this point. Oh, okay. Well, I'll I'll take the time for a few minutes. I thank the gentleman, uh, Mr. Ferriero. You oversee, from a FOIA standpoint, a tremendous amount of information. Even though you work with the libraries, where many of the assets uh, reside, ultimately a Freedom of Information Act request on any president covered under your records, your your many archives belongs to you, isn't that correct? That is right. How many people do you have roughly doing for you within your jurisdiction, directly and indirectly, because obviously librarians, uh, the various libraries assist? We, yes. Well, uh, we, we do submit a report to the Department of Justice that has that number. I am afraid I don't r remember specifically. It is in the many hundreds, but, though. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you, well, at the presidential libraries where FOIA applies, which is Reagan forward, there is probably about 50, roughly 50 archivists doing FOIA review and processing. And then there is at least that number uh, dealing with Federal archival records here in Washington and in our regional archives. But if I can follow up, the, uh, the desire to FOIA 30-year-old material generally from the government is pretty minimal, right? In other words, agencies control for 30 years their documents. You control them when they are too old for anyone to ask. Well, the, 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 the original model of the archives was you wanted the records to get to an age where they are no longer needed by the agency and where the restrictions pretty much are lifted. So in the old model, after 30 years, when they transferred records to us, we could presume that the records were virtually open in their entirety, unless there was classified information or personal privacy information. So the ideal is when they come to us, we can just make them open you wouldn't need to make a FOIA request because you could just come to the research room and we could provide them. Okay. So that now, was the model. Now following up on that, because this really is a major reform committee on both pieces of legislation uh, question, today, if President Obama were to decide not to run for a second term, which I understand he's already made that decision, 
you are only two years away from receiving four years of information. So you have this variable that goes from four years to eight years. Presumably it will be eight years for this administration like it was for the previous two. But when I look at the Department of Homeland Security, you have got decades before, under completely different cabinet officers, those records are going to be available. In a sense, in your opinion, and Mr. Ferriero, I think I will bring this one to you, in a sense, doesn't an administration sunset and an even hand of a nonpartisan entity become the more logical custodian at the end of an administration of, for example, Department of Homeland Security from the Bush administration? Right now, uh, Secretary Napolitano hires 400 people to decide whether or not Bush-era records are publicly available or not. Does that seem like an area of modernization that we should hold hearings on and decide whether or not to take the entire presidency as a period of time in order to refresh broadly? And that is why I asked about your own uh, history, because you are making FOIA decisions on President W. Bush today. Well, in fact, you are not making decisions on any of his people in his administration. Instead, the succeeding administration of the opposite party is making those decisions. Complex question, what, what would you but say? It is um, an, an interesting thought. Well, I would just uh, add, under the Presidential Records Act, when we receive the records from an administration, there is a five-year period where there is no public access. So, in fact, right now, we still, there is still no, no access under FOIA. Without joint consent. Well, the administration can choose to release. A post administration does have release. There have been releases after administration has gone sunset, but they have been in concert. Before the five years, very tiny amount. And so, so generally, it is not until five years after the administration leaves office that we, we start opening records to FOIA requests on a systematic basis. This but that is still 15 plus years sooner than you will the Cabinet officers' records. So, so the notion that if, if we were to get more records earlier and have to process them, I think that would have to be accompanied by a rather massive uh, addition of, of staff and resources to deal with the processing element of it. And you know, the part of the old model is they are the agency's records, the agencies can decide. You know, on the restrictions and on access and all, and they have greater resources than we would have if we took in massive amounts of, of agency records in addition to presidential well, records. Well, even my borrowed time is now expiring, but I, I, I would let you know what I am thinking and, and the ranking member. It has become my at least straw person belief that, in fact, FOIA should broadly not belong to the administration, that it should be handed off in its greatest portion to individuals who report to someone who wants public information public, private information private, and who is apolitical. That, that general belief doesn't change the fact that the Department of Defense, what is going on today, must be determined by the Department of Defense and its current Cabinet officer. But the sooner that transfer were to occur, the more likely the public would have a fair right to know, not in any way determined either by the vindictiveness of the next administration or the graciousness of covering up by the next administration, both of which, quite frankly, the record shows there has been a certain amount of that that has gone on under both parties. Uh, I recognize the ranking member for his second round. Yeah, I was just um, listening to the uh, Chairman's proposal. Um, one of you said that everything seems to boil down to discretion when it, I mean, even a proposal like that, um, determining which records are supposed to be released under FOIA. But let, let me um, want to go back to you, Mr. Fierio. Um You, in answering one of the Chairman's questions, uh, he was talking about uh, those personal emails where somebody says, I got to stay late because something has gone on in the White House, and I've got to run. You know, just a little note to their wife or husband or whatever. You're not trying to preserve those kind of records, are you? They are. They're, they are captured. Those, but that's they're, not the kind of stuff that you really are that interested in. Well, it's it's interesting because I learned a lot when we um, were working on the Elena Kagan confirmation hearing, and we had to deliver um, a lot of content from the uh, Clinton White House. Uh, Sixty-five thousand email messages uh, that Elena Kagan, you know. 
had um, some role in. And very often, um, it, those messages were a combination of personal and business. And it is hard to separate out um, uh, unless you are going message by message and determining what is personal and what is not, what's not personal. So the, you know, the, the, the uh, procedure, policy in the White House now of capturing everything uh, works for me. Mr. Colangelo, in your beginning of your testimony, you talked about um, how you had to come in and um, equipment apparently was outdated and there were some problems. Uh, we needed to just bring, I guess, our software up to um, so that it could do the job we needed it to do. And I was wondering, where are we now with that? I mean, and how do you make sure? I was just telling the um, chairman a few minutes ago that he and I came along a while back, and we can still remember when people were using carbon paper and typewriters. And, um, and the whole technology changes, seems like, every five or six days, if not every day. So how do you keep up with that? How do you make sure you stay on the cutting edge and at the same time make sure that it is a, a balanced approach so you are not just getting equipment that is going to be outdated you know, tomorrow? And I, and I ask that so that and with just trying to figure out the efficiency and effectiveness of maintaining these records. You follow me? I think about, I've got, believe it or not, I've got some H racks in my basement <laughs> and nothing to play them on. And um, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so I'm just, just wondering. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Cummings. Um, Congressman, what we did in the beginning of the administration was really invest in stabilizing our core. We averaged um, somewhere in the 70 percent uptime in the first 40 days of the administration. Now we're over 99 percent operational uptime. Um, we had to replace a lot of key systems because they were not um, they were in need of upgrade. Um, how we do this now going forward is we have a continual um, investment in our infrastructure so that it's not an uphill battle. It's a constant level flow that we are constantly upgrading new systems. As I mentioned in my testimony, we're we're looking at an upgrading of our archiving system before it becomes out of date. So let's let's beat that before it gets to that end of life state. Um, and now we constantly look at new technology before integrating it into the EOP enterprise f to ensure that it, is, that it does um, follow the compliance of records management and, and helps meet the business need. Right? So it is constantly meeting that business need and also making sure that we are compliant with that. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I would just again ask that we schedule a date as soon as possible for the marking up 1144. Mr. Ferriero, I think, has agreed that this is a giant step in the right direction. It is really non-controversial, and I think it is something that we all could be proud of and could do in a bipartisan way. And I just re again, I ask that, and uh, with that, I will yield back. I thank the gentleman, and I will just do a very short second round myself. Uh, Mr. Perio, the, uh, the challenge you face would appear to be that each administration uh, delivers you records in a certain way. The Clinton administration, as I understand it, delivered you Lotus Notes uh, as, a, as a system. Famously, from this committee's standpoint, the next president tried to take Lotus Notes and transfer it to Microsoft Office Suite, including Exchange, uh, and then discovered, among other things, that their image backups were not capturing. So we have seen these transitions. What is it we can do for you broadly as the archivist? either through mandating that the systems that are delivered to you be in an open format or an interoperable format or in some format that at least allows you to port them in the future uh, that would help you. As we look at updating these things, there, there is sort of the question of if you, paper was understood, you know, you could specify 8.5 by 14 bond paper with a uh, 10 courier. But those days are gone, and if I had DOS 3.3 word perfect, followed by, uh, you know, we won't even go through SuperCalc and all the other programs that are long forgotten, they would deliver me an amazing nightmare. You have that, don't you? 
I do have that nightmare, and it makes paper look very good today. Uh, the electronic records archive that, that we are creating, in fact, um, is designed to accommodate those changes in technology as well as changes in attachment, so neutralized formats, basically, um, to make it possible for us to migrate the, the um, digits um, through time so that they are available in perpetuity. On the other end, being much more um, in, involved in, at the creation point, as I talked about earlier, is important to us so that we can establish standards uh, around email creation and electronic record creation and capture. So in closing, if in our modernization legislation we mandated that all agencies uh, give you sufficient comfort with their preservation on an annual basis so that either the, the material could be transferred or changes could be made so that the next year you are not getting two years of information that is going to be very expensive uh, to change, that would be helpful. Secondly, if, in fact, we design for transfer in, at the front end, then you could save and the American people could save a huge amount of money. Isn't that correct? I agree. Well, that will be, among other things, in our uh, legislation. I will close, Mr. Uh, Colangelo. Uh, you talked about the good and the bad of the Bush administration. Is there a way that we could ensure that the funding and the, uh, uh, the capability of each administration were more best practices as a matter of course, or is it simply that President Bush did a great job of capturing email archives and, and creating the NAS and the vault and so on? Well, toward the end, refreshing servers was not a priority and you inherited them over three years old. I mean, those kinds of good and bad should we have a role, or are you satisfied that each administration does the best they can and hands off? From a technology standpoint, I think it is important to invest in infra infrastructure um, so that there is a continual um, uh, flat line there versus the up and down. Okay. I might note, by the way, that uh, the White House has always, almost always been at least one generation of the exchange system ahead of the House. <laughs> and with that, I thank all of you. And, oh, I apologize. Now I would recognize Mr. Langford for a second round. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Collins, I just had a couple questions for you. Uh, reading through your notes, and I apologize for slip, slipping a little bit late here. Tell me a little bit about uh, the Facebook tracking and Twitter. I know certain sites or certain uh, locations have that, uh, have access. Others are blocked from that. Uh, how is that being tracked? I see some conflict on, on how we are able to handle, handle that with the technology. Thank you, Congressman. So from a technology standpoint, we have an enterprise-wide gateway that blocks all right. staff from accessing these. And then when a, um, a component staff member makes a request for this, it is reviewed by their counsel. And then if it is appropriate for the business use, they are allowed access through a, a certain policy and they have access to a, right. an approved number of sites. Um, we have looked for an enterprise-wide uh, preservation system. Um, technology hasn't matured enough uh, currently, but we are continuing to look and hoping that it will come around. Um, what happens now is uh, records are preserved by a component-by-component -component basis. Um, and I know today, actually, the White House released a blog post on whitehouse.gov uh, describing their process for um, uh, capturing records on some of these sites. So, for example, on Twitter, they use an RSS feed, real simple syndication that emails back into the email archive system, and Facebook uses uh, screen captures. And then for different sites, we have API. There are APIs that capture this, and then sometimes it is just electronic capturing of a screen. Right. The email system that's used specifically with uh, Facebook or the uh, message to message with Twitter, how are those captured? So for every individual that is uh, um, provided access into the social networking sites. They are provided additional guidance and training from legal counsel on um, uh, their Presidential Record Act ob obligations. Right. So, but you are saying currently they are not capturing weights. So the other Gmail and those things are blocked for that, but the actual email out of Facebook, they are just given guidance saying don't do it on that one. But they are not actually tracked, they are not recorded, they are not anything. So a personal message, for instance, on a, another email of don't forget to grab milk on the way home, would be captured through the traditional email system. But a message that is going through Facebook through the email system on that for those computers would not be captured in any way. 
uh, personal email is blocked, again, from all EOB right. systems. I mean, if they did yep. it through the traditional system. That's correct. correct. Um, uh, on individual users within the, the it is managed on a component by component basis for those who have access to those um, suites. As I mentioned, we don't have an enterprise preservation system currently available. Okay. Is that an issue for us, that there is basically email that is going through our system that is basically they are just told not to do anything on that that should be related to official business, that it just be personal on that, or what are the parameters that are given to them to say, you have access to Facebook, but please don't? In these areas, I, I know that the guidance is pretty um, pretty detailed. I don't have ac that access, so I haven't gone through the trading, so I can't actually speak to that. Okay. Do you, do you consider that to be an issue for us at this point? That we do have a series of email communications that are hanging out there that we're not archiving, or do you think that how, how can we know on that one way or the other? Well, from a from a numbers perspective, it's it's roughly two percent, as I and I noted in my um, written testimony. So like seventy percent, two percent of the EOP population that have this access on, on the government systems, um, and and these users are special users in and of themselves. That they are that, that that's part of the issue. Is it's not just that there's two percent. It's who are the two percent? I guess would make a, a significant difference. Sure, and it's largely the, the the users are largely the White House new media team, the folks that manage the president's uh, President Obama's Facebook and the other Facebook accounts out there, um, and then I know it's also for um, some lawyers for assessing of candidates, uh, as it's a common corporate practice as, to, as well to look at social networking. Is that something that we would consider valuable in a preservation status? Uh, Spur, is that something that you would think somewhere down the road people would want to be able to look at? It is the business of the White House. It is the, you know, those are presidential records. Right. That, that, I think we need to find a solution to that. Uh, that is one of those things that is hanging out. I understand the technology change and, and how things are shifting. There is nothing off the shelf on that, but it may be something we need to address in the coming days. Uh, obviously, this president, is, as is par for our culture as a whole, is very interested in uh, being able to use social media sites, and I think it is very appropriate. The inappropriate side is we have a large volume of a lot of interaction with constituents and with people and with the White House that is not being tracked and is not being monitored. Uh, will we continue to look into this technology? We are hoping that the industry evolves. I, I would just suggest that is something we need to address in the coming days to be able to establish whether it is a relationship with the social sites or some way to be able to establish that technology-wise. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. And I thank the gentleman for his interest. And with your history of tracking, what, 21,000 young people every year going through your, uh, your camps, I suspect that you know more about uh, how to keep track of the hardest things to keep track of in the world. And with that, I want to thank all of our witnesses. You have been very generous with your time. I appreciate your input. It will help us as we go forward. Uh, clearly, some of you will be back again. Uh, as we try to implement good policy after so many years of a law sustaining us. And with that, we stand adjourned.